We asked our viewers to tell us which board games they've been playing to see what people's current favourite games actually are. Old favourites, the newest hotness, you may be surprised. We're counting down the games they picked up next in this month's People's Choice Top 10. And I'm here. Hello, I'm Matthew and joining me to count down the 10 games our viewers are playing the most is it's Paul, Paul is here. Paul Surprise! I didn't ruin anything by talking before I was supposed to. Hi, I'm excited. Number 10 <laughs> is the Gloom Chronicles. <laughs> Take a journey through the miserable world of Gloom, a caustic card game in which you and your friends weave tales of woe. Each story begins with an unhappy birthday, but from there, it could involve a tragic train ride or even end up with the infamous World's Unfair. The Gloom Chronicles is an expansion that enhances any game of Gloom with narrative prompts that gives players a unified foundation for their stories, while variant rules challenge new and experienced players alike. The unhappy birthday awaits. Where will your Gloom Chronicle end? I think that's what the world needs. It's just more Gloom. It's like that classic song, what the world needs now. It's Gloom. Sweet gloom. Amanda says that I love killing my opponents with good fortune. It's the ultimate form of revenge. Now, I did hear recently that success is the ultimate form of revenge. And I feel like Amanda is taking that on board with gloom. Another misquoted quote because they people think, oh, the greatest revenge is my success. But it's actually the success of the people you want to get revenge on. And Amanda's got that figured out. Well, now I'm... I'm confused, it's like revenge -ception. Gloom also has really cool art. It's like Edward Gorey kind of art. It has clear cards so that when you stack them, you're like adding on to like your character's sad story of how they died. And this actually sounds really cool, this narrative through line. Thanks, Amanda, for that quote and everyone else who voted for this. It wasn't just Amanda, I'm assuming. Here is the first sponsor that made this episode possible. Hello, it's yet another version of me, but for something that only has one version, it's the limited time Iron Man promo cards from Upper Deck who helped make this episode possible. David Palumbo is a highly regarded freelance traditional and digital illustrator who has contributed to the 2020 Marvel Masterpieces trading card set. And now his artwork graces this exclusive limited time Iron Man promo card for Legendary, which you can get free when you spend over $49 on any Legendary Marvel deck building game or Marvel accessories at UpperDeckStore.com. And whether you pick up the most recent Legendary expansion, Legendary, Doctor Strange and the Shadows of Nightmare, or these new 65 card sleeve packs featuring Ghost Rider, Gambit or Spectrum, or other qualifying items, you'll also receive the limited time Iron Man promo card free with a purchase over $49. Until supplies run out, exclusively at UpperDeckStore.com. Number 9, Rococo Deluxe Edition. In Rococo, owners of a distinguished tailoring business endeavour to increase their prestige by performing tasks such as hiring new employees, tailoring exquisite gowns and frocks, coats to rent or sell, or funding some of the many decorations at the party. The Deluxe Edition contains the previously released Jewelry Box expansion, the Festivity Dresses expansion and the Fancy Dresses promo, as well as a new Madame du Barry solo mode expansion. And additionally, it features premium components including resin tokens, upgraded player markers, velveteen cloth bags and upgraded punch boards. Brian adds, I've played this game twice and enjoyed it quite a bit. Plus, it is gorgeous. Stephen Waffles says, who knew making dresses could be so cutthroat? Stephen Waffles, I think everyone who works in the fashion industry knew that making dresses could be so cutthroat. Just throwing that out there. Catching leaving wet toilet paper on the ground, then waiting people to walk through it, then walk onto a catwalk, thus ruining their career. Diabolical. Look, I can be <laughs> diabolical. I love Rococo, I will say that though. Rococo is a fantastic game. I've never played Rococo, and my question is why? Why have I not played this game? It sounds exactly like something I would like. I have another question. What is the difference between a festive dress and a fancy dress? Well, a festive dress would be worn at a festive occasion. A fancy dress is worn at a fancy occasion, unless you're in the UK, in which fancy dress does mean 
like a costume, like dressing as the Kool-Aid guy or something. <laughs> That's just a promo card for this game. What an entrance. <laughs> Dice Throne Season 1 Reroll is a remastered edition of Dice Throne Season 1 with two new characters, the Triant and Ninja. These and other heroes are each distinct from one another, attacking opponents and activating abilities by rolling their unique set of five dice as they accumulate combat points that you can spend to turn on upgrades that have long lasting effects. Carman Chan says finally got around to playing Dice Throne and he doesn't disappoint. Looking forward to Marvel Dice Throne. We played Dice Throne together and as far as my memory serves, I won. Now see, I was gonna say actually that as far as my memory serves, I won? That can't be right. One of us is wrong. I think it's you. There's only one way to settle this. <laughs> With the game of Dice Throne. With the game of Dice Throne, absolutely. Dennis says, my son loves it. He also discovered online that there's merchandise you can buy, such as t-shirts. And there's something about this quote that makes me feel like this merchandise is coming out of like the trunk of a car. I don't know if that means that the merchandise is not real merchandise. It's some type of illicit activity is happening and that's my main worry. Maybe because it's, it's the ninja merchandise. So it's like, most of the time you can't even see it, but sometimes it just shows up out of nowhere. Like an Amazon delivery driver. Exactly. Number seven, possibly the most prominent mass market war game, Risk. The goal is nothing short of conquest of the entire world even the damp parts near the ocean where all that sand is. To accomplish this orb-owning objectives, players take and hold territories and earn reinforcements, attack and defend territories with dice-based combat and strategically redeem bonus cards for additional forces at just the right time. Brian says, so many childhood memories and fights over world domination. Preston E says, my, my son is getting old enough to start into more strategic games, so I broke out Risk recently and I've been teaching him to play. It's fun to teach my boys the games I loved at their age. When I was a kid, I always wanted to play it because it had like cute little like figures. Our copy had like cute little figures of people on horses. And I was like, cool, that looks awesome. But then I would pull the game out and realize that it wasn't actually about playing with fun toys. It was like the horrors of war. Fun though, I don't think I've ever played Risk. Well, I've never played Risk either, actually. I think because I was scarred by it as a kid, I was like, this is gonna be fun. This looks dry. And so that stuck in my head and I've never tried to play it. This is too mass market. I'm just getting, I'm getting into this niche hobby. Risk, dice, I'm a Euro gamer. I feel like Risk counts as a Euro game. Oh, come off it. Dice and rolling and Australia. It's all about like area control and moving things around. That counts as a Euro. It's literally got people, <laughs> it's people on a map. The only way to settle this. A game of dice throw. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> plan and design a modern, scientifically managed zoo in Ark Nova, with the ultimate goal of owning the most successful zoological establishment. Players build enclosures, accommodate animals, and support conservation projects all over the world, even the damp parts near the oceans, with all the sand. This game has been compared favourably to Terraforming Mars as another deeply strategic adventure in developing a plan based on the given resources that become available during any given game, and then executing that plan to the best of one's abilities. So Don G says, I've played Ark Nova seven times so far. It deserves its hype. That's more than I've played most games ever, I think. Seven times? You think that's your upper limit? Well, I, re I feel like if I've played a game three times, like, we're doing pretty good. Three times? Seven times might as well be a hundred times. That doesn't make any sense. How many times have you played Ark Nova? Once. My friend bought it and I was like, yay, I get to play the hotness without having to own the hotness. It's a good game. I really liked it. It's quite long and involved, but I tell you, I had the whole thing going on with monkeys and I was loving it because my monkey park was fantastic. It was like Monkey World in Weymouth. I said that's a very localized kind of joke it's I feel like that you've just fine. Told. We have viewers across the world, Paula. People are like, oh, I've been there. I've been to Weymouth. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I can't actually believe how quickly Ark Nova has risen up in the ranks of 
BGG. It shot oh, up no. the board game geek ratings like a chimpanzee at a chain link fence at a Weymouth based primate park. And can you take me there next time we do aircon, Matthew? It's not on route, but yes, we can go. <laughs> Frantic, high-stakes bets placed in secret as million-dollar race cars speedily weave around the track. This is the world of downforce, a world of motor racing in which the margin between victory and defeat can be in a single moment. A steep bank turn, tyres screaming and spitting out smoke, a wayward moose wanders its way onto the track, it could happen especially as the downforce presses the drivers down into their seat as they swerve inside to pull ahead. So Preston E said that Downforce is my favourite recent purchase. I've been looking for it diligently since watching Monique and Naveen's playthrough and couldn't find it anywhere. Then spotted it in an episode of Chaz's Buyer's Guide during his tour of Target and sure enough found it at my local Target too. Definitely a new favourite and everyone I've shared it with has loved it. Downforce is such a great convention game because while everyone's playing deep, heavy, thinky stuff. Six of you can be screaming in the corner. <laughs> it's fantastic, it's so good. Chaz is like, hey, based on Preston's quote, I'm the hero, I helped him find this thing. And I kind of like, Chaz, this is our video? Like maybe don't weasel your way in. I'll be honest, I've never enjoyed Chaz. He is editing this. We should probably be saying nice things about him. Chaz, you are a hero. Nope. Oh, we're gonna keep waxing poetic about more games. But first, here's an ad from the other sponsor that helped make this episode possible. Hi guys. <laughs> it's awkward. But nevertheless, I am going to jump right into this episode's other sponsor, Envelopes of Cash. Because time is money. And there are two things that we all never seem to have enough of unless you're a college sports recruiter in this game where it seems there's always one more envelope of cash waiting to help grease the wheels of <clears throat> collegiate athletic participation. In the game, college coaches populate programs with players by drafting cards and dice, allowing them to acquire elite players, personnel, and boost their program's culture with completely legitimate, I swear, under the table cash investments. Uh, pensions run high because there's only 12 months to secure the top athletes and out-recruit your rival schools. Now the game's Kickstarter campaign successfully completed and is now currently in the late pledge mode, meaning that right now is your last chance to follow the link in this video's description to get in on this game's stretch goals and extra content before well, being left on the sidelines. It's the year 2849 and humanity has harnessed the power of the pulsars in Pulsar 2849. Now we must find a way to distribute this power throughout the stars, even the damp ones near the oceans. <laughs> In this Euro-style game, players explore space, claim pulsars and discover technologies that will help them build energy distribution infrastructures on a cosmic scale. Dice are used to purchase actions and players choose their dice from a communal pool. There are many paths to victory, allowing players to blaze their own trail to a bright future. With Gabriel L saying that this is a great game, it deserves more love. I do think this is the kind of game that you would enjoy. I really do. Yeah? It's a great Euro. It really is. Does it have dice in it? Uh-huh. Then, based on your logic earlier about risk, it's not a Euro, is it? Oh, yeah. Gotcha! Gotcha! That's not what that's not quite what I said, but fine. That's all I heard. You can <laughs> Legitimately, that's all I heard. This isn't a Euro because it has dice. So long, Bora Bora by Stefan <laughs> Castles of Burgundy, you're out. <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> you a merit trash game. In the city building game, The Foundations of Rome, ancient architects compete to claim land and build magnificent structures, gaining glory for themselves and the empire. With 96 detailed miniatures of city structures, players collect glory points based on the population and commerce that they have brought to the city. Placement and timing are both important, and executing the right action at the right time can mean the difference between building a strong foundation of Rome or watching it crumble into ruins. Stephen A said, backed this on Kickstarter, which is a classic defense of any game if I ever heard one. Have you seen the box that this comes in? Yeah, it's like 
as big as me, basically. It's a full Kallax shelf. And how do you pull it back out? You, I, you have to go from behind. You have to just like push it, it back. And then... <laughs> you know those big batteries that you put in like fire alarms? and they have like a little ribbon underneath them. You have to kind of like pull the ribbon. Yeah, that you have that in there and you pull the ribbon and then that pulls the game out. It was an add-on, yeah. Arcane Wonders thought of everything for it. I will say, Foundations of Rome, I played it. My friend backed it, which I was very happy about. Also, it was the only yeah. thing he had to say about the game. I backed this. It's a classic defense of any game if I ever heard one. Firstly, I won, which really does help boost any game in my Wait opinion. Wait a minute, is that why you dislike every game we play together that I end up winning? I wouldn't have any experience in that, so... I win sometimes. I simply erase those from my memory. That's why you stopped logging your board games. It is a really good game. I am waiting for the non-deluxe version so that I can buy it. <laughs> the looking glass has shattered. Madness is being drained from the inhabitants and war has come to Wonderland in Wonderland's War. Two to five players join in battle as they lead factions of fictional freaks from the Hatter's Tea Party. Between sips of tea and nibbles of cake, the forces are moved around the table, drafting cards, building towers, achieving upgrades and recruiting more Wonderlandians to the cause. Who will muster enough strength though to win the battle and conquer Wonderland for their own? TJ says that this game hit the table almost immediately after it arrived on my front door. I've been waiting for a long time for this one and it did not disappoint. And Crystal Z says that if this doesn't win every award for best game production quality, I'll be shocked. Every component is a work of art. I'm obsessed. So I actually have a story about this. I'm pretty sure in the very first On The Radar that I ever filmed way before we were even on Watch It Played Matthew when it was still just a, a a video I was doing with Chaz. I've never enjoyed Chaz. I'm pretty sure I talked about Wonderland's War, but the reason it sticks out to me is because I did this bit when I was filming it where I, I went out and bought cupcakes. And then while I was filming, I ate a cupcake while I was talking about this game. So now whenever I think about this game, I think about this really delicious lemon cupcake that I ate. And I think that does make me biased toward the game because it makes me think about cake. You have a Pavlovian response. It wasn't a Pavlova. So it was a Cupcakean response. Cupcakean response, which brings me on to my other point. Wonderlandians? Surely they're Wondwegian. Wondwegians, yes, that's what I would have thought. Wondwegians. Number one, the castles of Burgundy. In the castles of Burgundy, aristocrats in high medieval France each control a small princedom. As the game progresses, they aim to build settlements and powerful castles, conduct trade, mine silver and glean knowledge from travellers. Players take settlement tiles from the game board and place them into their princedom consisting of several regions, each of which demands its own type of settlement tile. The 2019 edition of the Castles of Burgundy includes eight expansions, seven of which were previously released as promotional items and one new one to this release. I just had, I think, my highest score I've ever had in a game of Castles of Burgundy, which I have played like 25 or 30 times this year. Wow, that's way more than seven. It's way more than seven. It's, I've basically played it a thousand times now. I scored 244 points. That's a lot of points. I'll, I'll admit that. That's a lot of points in that game. I remember when you'd never played it, and I was like, hey, you gotta play the Castle of Burgundy. It's got dice in, don't worry, it's not a Euro. <laughs> <laughs> I might be kind of obsessed with Castles of Burgundy right now. It's one of the best games ever made, it's so good. It's always been in my top 10 games. It's always been in my top five games. I absolutely love the Castles of Burgundy. It's fantastic. I'm starting to learn like the good techniques, like about how to get all the points from your animals the best way. I kind of want to play it right now. I'm worried about playing it with you. And Stephen Waffles says, love this game someday. I'll actually maybe win. Only if you can get to 244 points, Stephen. Haynes says, why do I always get addicted to the games I can't win? Look, I know how you feel because for a long time, I wasn't winning this game. But did you know I just won with a score of 244 points? Blah, 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 blah. It could happen to you. Hornets34 says, I've been playing this a lot on Board Game Arena. Have they been playing it with you? Yes. yes. Did you beat them by a bunch of points in the game? Maybe 244 points. <laughs> yes! That's why we're the Watch It Play team. <laughs> Helen W says, such a good game, even worth all the setup with those Tidgy hexes. Now, first of all, Tidgy. 
Is that British, Matthew? I don't know. It's certainly in English, but I like it. I think it's a great word, Tidgy. I'm doing it. I'm using it moving forward. I don't know how I feel about that. And that's a sampling of what our viewers have been playing this month. To see the games on our own personal radars, continue on to this month's On The Radar episode, or don't scroll. Follow the link in the description to our Patreon to find out how to pick the games featured in next month's People's Choice episode. We'll see you over there. Bye. I was here. And Paula. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.